We are changing the conception of education as a human right towards a conception of education as a, a free choice market where the citizen will be able to choose what's the best school for their children. What we are starting to do is we're seeing um, education uh, being a commodity that can be bought and sold in not just a national market but increasingly um, an international market. The key element of neoliberal globalisation is the drive to commodify, to put into a form from which profit can be extracted of practically of everything that you can manage. If we're not producing cars, fridges and all those, you know, goods, then what would the developed economies significantly produce? So they began pushing a case for the development of uh, services in the developed economies and that these services would then be sold to uh, low-income countries, so finance services and, and so on. Now, if we take ourselves kind of forward to 1995, we see the World Trade Organization, it launches itself, and it's now not just concerning itself with how to regulate uh, global trade in goods, but it presented um, the GATS, which is the General Agreement on Trade and Services. Hugely controversial, because for the first time, education gets picked up as a services sector. One of the things about globalisation as a project is everywhere to reduce the role of the state and to reduce the state's regulatory role. As a result of this, this neoliberal movement, public services become routinely privatised. There are two main paradigms today of education reform. One is the rights-based approach, uh, and another one would be a, a more market approach. Both approaches can be similar, or can, can look similar in the sense that all of them mean that we should invest more in education. Education is a human right because every single person of the world is entitled to the benefit, to the, the, to the fulfillment of an education that makes him and her a fully empowered citizen to make informed decisions. So it is a human right that actually spills over and articulates all other human rights. Education for all goals are a rights-based approach. The goals were set in Dakar in the year 2000. There are six goals in total which cover a whole range of issues within education. These were translated into the Millennium De Development Goals in a much narrower sense. So the Millennium Development Goal for Education looks at ensuring that all children can complete a cycle of primary schooling. And the Millennium Development Goal on Gender also looks at ensuring gender parity, so equal access of education between boys and girls. The international community actually has committed to international cooperation. If you look at the, the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, what it says is that international community is obliged, and the term is obliged, to cooperate when a nation is, does not have sufficient resources. The kind of irony to some extent is that Education for All Millennium Development Goals is the kind of legitimating rhetoric for why private uh, firms should get involved in uh, providing or delivering education in low-income countries in particular. What we've seen is um, the creation of kind of actually quite large, uh, you know, chains of firms now um, that use this education for all rhetoric. Um, and the World Bank clearly does that too. Our uh, sector strategy that was published this year specifically states education is a, a human right. And we see our goal as contributing marginally to increasing the understanding about what it means to ensure that everyone has access to education, but education of high quality. One of the things that has never been within the agenda of the World Bank, clearly, in education policy, it's what happened to educational inequalities. 
Now it's quite paradoxical because the bank itself is recognizing that those systems that have better equity within their education systems, they perform better, but they keep equity uh, out of the agenda as a, as a policy goal. Okay, so when they talk, for instance, for the, uh, about the introduction of pre more privatization of education, it's not really looked from the equity point of view. The global consensus seems to be that education contributes to uh, economic development and therefore poverty reduction because those countries that are growing are able to provide services for the poor but also to provide jobs that will reduce the number of uh, people that are in poverty. Education contributes by increasing the productivity of individuals. It contributes by increasing the productivity of societies. So the equity part of it is, is a um, development goal. It's not an add-on. Without equity, education systems will be divisive. They won't contribute to the uh, spillovers that we need to make them more productive and therefore contribute to national income growth and to national poverty reduction. It is absolutely crucial that it is the state that has to be behind public education. When you introduce competition as a mechanism of supposedly um, improving the systems, you will generate a double-tier system and you will end up segregating. You will prize those. Those who do good will always do better. Those that do bad will always do worse. The state cannot, cannot back a double-tier system. The state has to wish, has to aim for all its citizens to advance in all their human potential, in all their citizen potential, and in advancing democracy. For me, the, 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 the global debate in education has centered around um, achievement, and countries are comparing themselves to other countries, uh, thanks to TIMS and especially the OECD's PISA assessment that publishes league tables on countries' achievement, the debate becomes much more centered around national education systems, which I think is an appropriate question. And then the next question is, what contributes to those, to those outcomes? Why is Shanghai scoring uh, so high? Why does Finland score so high? And countries are asking these questions, then reflecting on their own systems. I think in some ways PISA can be seen as the embryo of a global educational passport because you'll be able to go everywhere and say, what's your PISA score? If PISA is controlling your life chances, how do you get to influence PISA? I think that there are governments in poor countries that they are today quite desperate to, to really have a bigger education performance. So, they are open to try other policy solutions because they have a crisis in their education system. So, and these uh, international players are telling to me that this will work. So I will buy it. It's not like they are totally convinced, but they are open to, to different options. We want to base our decisions on, uh, or, or provide information to decision makers on what are the most effective mechanisms for improving uh, learning outcomes. And we see this as both a, uh, an efficiency goal, making countries more competitive, increasing productivity, but, but also it's an equity goal. An equity focus is really crucial to ensuring that we achieve what is the intended um, outcome of the education for all goal, that every child has the right to education. We want to see how programs affect the uh, most disadvantaged in society and how they can be made to perform better and achieve uh, equity and efficiency at the same time. To make sure that that happens means that you need a very strong state. When providing education, when regulating education, when funding education. Whether private actors participate or not, you have to make sure that the discourse of competition, market choice, etc., is not going to affect uh, the, the right to education, even of, of one of your, of your citizens.